Hello, Assalamualaikum. Uh, in the last class, we have discussed about the few configurations of the cycle, and we have left two numericals, which we are going to discuss in this class. Okay. So the problem statement says, determine the specific work output, specific fuel consumption, and the cycle efficiency for the heat exchange cycle, which is shown here, having the following specifications. The compressor pressure ratio is four. Turbine inlet temperature is 1100 Kelvin. Isentropic efficiency of the compressor is 0.85. Similarly, the isentropic efficiency of the turbine is 0.87. Mechanical transmission efficiency is 0.99. Combustion efficiency is 0.98. Heat exchanger effectiveness is 0 0.80. And in the last, we are given some pressure losses. So at the combustor chamber, the delta PB is given as 2% compressor delivery pressure. Okay, so the combustion in the combustion chamber, the pressure losses are assumed to be 2% of the compressor delivery pressure, and at the heat exchanger air side, these are given as 3% compressor delivery pressure, and at the heat exchanger gas side. The pressure is zero. The pressure loss is 0 0.04 bar. Okay, and the ambient conditions are one bar and 288 Kelvin. So first of all, in this cycle, we know that the air after compressor goes to the heat exchanger, thereby increasing the thermal efficiency because some quantity of the fuel that has to be burned in order to increase the temperature from two to three has now decreased because of the preheating in the heat exchanger okay and finally the expansion is done in the turbine which is going to drive the compressor and the rest of the expansion in the turbine is used to produce the network output okay so first of all we will try to solve this numerical by using uh, starting from our calculations from the compressor side so from the compressor as you know since the air that is coming into the compressor is at the ambient so we can calculate t02 minus ta that is the difference of the temperature of the air before and after the compressor so t02 minus ta is given as ta by compressor efficiency into p02 by pa raised to power gamma minus 1 by gamma minus 1 okay so we know the value of ta t is 288 kelvin and compressor efficiency is 0 0.85 and this pressure ratio for the compressor is 4 raised to power gamma minus 1 by gamma comes out to be 1 over 3.5 okay minus 1 so did this delta T, T02 minus TA comes out to be roughly around 165 Kelvin. So this shows that 165 Kelvin is the increase in the temperature of the air when the air comes out from the compressor. Okay. And the turbine work required to drive the compressor per unit mass flow is given as, so this is the mechanical efficiency. This is the turbine work output. The expansion in the turbine is from state 3 to 4. Okay, so we have to account for the mechanical losses in terms of the mechanical efficiency. So, turbine work required to drive the compressor per unit mass flow rate would come out to be CPA delta T T02 minus TA divided by the mechanical efficiency will be equivalent to. So, this is the specific heat capacity at the air side. Uh, so which is 1.005 times 165 divided by 0.99 so this comes out to be 167.2 kilojoule per kg the pressure of the air that is entering into the turbine p03 will be equal to the pressure of the air that is coming out from the compressor minus the losses in the combustion chamber 
and the losses that are account in the heat exchanger side so we have taken p02 as common and we are left with p02 into bracket 1 minus del pb by p02 minus del ph by p02 okay so the air that is coming into the turbine with the pressure of course there is a pressure drop in the combustion chamber and there is a pressure drop in the heat exchanger so p03 will be equal to p02 times 1 minus del pb by p02 minus del ph by p02 so p02 is 4 and this pb that is the pressure loss in the combustion chamber is taken as 0.2% which is 2% of the compressor delivery pressure compressor delivery pressure is p02 so this ratio will be equal to 0 0.02 and uh, losses uh, the pressure losses in the heat exchanger are given as 3% of the compressor delivery pressure so which is 3% which comes out to be 0 0.03 so finally the pressure of the air that is entering into the turbine is 3.8 bars and as far as the pressure of the air that is coming out from the turbine will be equal to the atmospheric pressure plus the pressure losses at the heat exchanger side so this will become 1.04 bars and hence we can now take the ratio of p03 by p04 which is 3.654 okay now since gamma is equal to 1.3 for the expanding gases the temperature equivalent of the total turbine work from this equation as you know this is the t03 minus t04 for the turbine the drop in the temperature is given as turbine efficiency times t03 multiplied by 1 minus 1 over p03 by p04 raised to power gamma minus 1 by gamma so the turbine isentropic efficiency is 0 0.87 and t03 maximum cycle temperature is 1100 kelvin and p03 by p04 is 3.65 and gamma minus 1 by gamma is 1 by 4 okay so this t03 minus t04 is roughly around 265 kelvin okay now the turbine work per unit mass flow rate is cpg cpg because uh, the gases are going to enter into the turbine side so instead of cpa we are using here cpg which is 1.148 okay times t03 minus t04 so the turbine work output per unit mass flow rate is 304 kilojoule per kg okay now remember that we are going to enter the same mass flow rate into the turbine as well as into the compressor so the net work output will be the difference of these two so we have to subtract these two uh, quantities to get the total specific work output okay which is 137 kilojoule per kg so it shows that for 100 kilowatt power plant roughly around mass flow rate of 7.3 kg per second would be required so the next step is to calculate the temperature of the air which is t05 okay now this temperature t05 can be computed from the heat exchanger effectiveness which shows the effectiveness is equal to the actual heat transfer divided by the maximum possible heat transfer actual heat transfer is t05 minus t02 and the maximum possible heat transfer is mcp t04 minus t02 mcp mcp are cancelled out so we have written the terms in terms of the temperature difference only so heat exchanger effectiveness is 0 0.80 which is equal to t05 minus t02 divided by t04 minus t02 okay so t02 is equal to 164.7 plus 288 so we have computed t02 minus ta from there you can uh, put the value of ta and you can find out the value of t02 which will come out to be roughly around 450 and t04 is equal to t03 uh, minus t04 from there you can find out the value of t04 because the maximum cycle temperature is 1100 which is t03 so you can find out the value of t04 which is 835 so we know t02 we know t04 so you can find out the value of t05 and the heat exchanger effectiveness is 80 percent 
so here you are the value of t05 is 758 kelvin okay now the rays of the temperature in the combustion chamber okay from the combustion chamber inlet temperature is 759 and the combustion temperature raise is uh, 1100 minus 759 which is 341 kelvin so a quantity of the heat is supplied in the combustion chamber in order to increase the temperature of the air from up to uh, in order to increase the temperature of the air up to roughly around 340 kelvin okay so in order to increase that much amount of the temperature a theoretical fuel air, air ratio is required which is 0 0.0094 okay so the actual fuel air ratio will be computed as the ratio of theoretical fuel ratio divided by the combustion efficiency okay so the combustion efficiency is 0.98 and the theoretical fuel air ratio is 0 0.0094 so the actual fuel air ratio will be 0 0.0096 okay theoretically of course it is less and in actual it has to be somewhat a higher figure so the specific fuel consumption is therefore actual fuel air ratio divided by the net work output or the specific work output so the specific work output is roughly around 137 kelvin and the actual fuel air ratio is 0 0.0096 so in order to express in terms of kilowatt hour we have multiplied it with the 3600 so a specific fuel consumption comes out to be 0.253 kilojoule per kilowatt hour Actually, the cycle efficiency can be given as the 3600 divided by specific fuel consumption times q net 253 so thermal efficiency will come out to be 33 okay. percent now we are going to deal with the next numerical and the numerical statement says determine the specific work output specific fuel consumption and the cycle efficiency for a simple gas turbine with a free power turbine as shown in figure so this is a power turbine so this high pressure turbine is going to drive the combustion pressure turbine is going to produce the net work output and, uh, so for the given specifications so we are given the compressor pressure ratio which is 12 turbine inlet temperature is 1350 kelvin isentropic efficiency of compressor is 0 0.86 turbine isentropic efficiency is 0 0.89 mechanical efficiency of the e-shaft is 0 0.99 combustion efficiency is 0 0.99 uh, combustion pressure loss is 6% of the compressor delivery pressure okay and the exhaust pressure loss is 0 0.03 bar and ambient pressure is 1 bar and the temperature are 288 Kelvin so while solving the numerical first of all uh, we will find the T02 minus T01 and then we can find out the value of T04 minus T03 and similarly in the previous numerical we have find out the value of the pressure which is P03 and we have to subtract the losses pressure losses in the combustion chamber and then we will be able to find out the value of the p03 and the power output which is produced by this high pressure turbine is equivalent to drive the compressor okay and the power which is produced by this power turbine which is low pressure turbine is going to drive the generator so a specific work output is only produced by this turbine we can write out t02 minus t01 is t01 divided by compressor efficiency into pressure ratio raised to power gamma minus 1 by gamma minus 1 so t01 is 288 kelvin compressor efficiency isentropic efficiency of the compressor is 0 0.86 and pressure ratio is 12 uh, and gamma minus 1 by gamma will come out to be 1 1 divided by 3.5 minus 1 so t02 minus t01 will come out to be 346.3 kelvin okay and similarly the turbine work output that is used to drive the compressor per unit mass flow rate is cpa times t02 minus t01 divided by the mechanical efficiency so cpa is 1.005 kilojoule per kg into kelvin and T02 minus T01 is 
346 divided by the mechanical efficiency is 0 0.99 so this WTC will be equivalent to 350 kg per kilojoule per kg then you can find out the value of P03 also uh, remember this is P03 not P02 P03 is P02 into 1 minus the pressure losses in the compressor uh, the pressure losses in the uh, combustion chamber which are 6% of the compressor delivery pressure which is P02 so delta PB divided by P02 is 6% which is 0 0.06 so P03 is equivalent to 12 into 1 minus 0 0.06 so P03 will come out to be 11.28 parts the intermediate pressure between two turbines P04 is unknown but can be determined from the fact that the compressor turbine produces just sufficient work to drive the compressor the turbine equivalent of the compressor turbine work is therefore so of course this is equivalent to the specific work output used to drive the compressor per unit mass flow rate times cpg into this uh, t03 minus t04 so cpg is 1.148 and T03 minus T04, you can find out the value of T03 by T04. Uh, you know the value of WTC, which is 351.5 Kelvin, and CPG as 1.148 Kelvin. So you can compute the value of this difference. The temperature drop in the turbine T03 minus T04 is 306.2 Kelvin. The corresponding pressure ratio can be found out uh, using the equation which is T03 minus T04 as turbine efficiency times T03 into 1 minus 1 over P03 by P04 rest to power gamma minus 1 by gamma. So T03 by T04 306.2 turbine uh, efficiency is 0.89 maximum cycle temperature is 1350 Kelvin into 1 minus 1 over pressure ratio rest for gamma minus 1 by gamma is 1 by 4 so 1 by 4 is equivalent to 0 0.25 and p03 by p04 is 3.243 okay so you know the value of p03 you can find out the value of p04 and p04 is equivalent to t03 minus 306 so T04 will come out to be 1043.8 Kelvin. The pressure at entry to the power turbine, which is P04, can be find out as 11.28 divided by 3.243. So which comes out to be 3.478 bar. And the power turbine pressure ratio is P04 by P05. P05 is 1 plus 0.03. So P04 by P05 is 3.377. So now you know the value of the P04 by P05. So you can find out the temperature drop in the low pressure turbine, which is T04 minus T05. So this is the turbine isentropic efficiency. And this is T04 into 1 minus 1 over P04 by P05. Rest to power gamma minus 1 by gamma, which is 0 0.25. So T04 by T05 will come out to be roughly around 245 Kelvin and the specific work output produced by the power turbine which is a low pressure turbine per unit mass flow rate is mechanical efficiency times CPG times temperature drop in the low pressure turbine which is T04 minus T05. So CPG is 1.148 and T04 minus T05 is 245 Kelvin and mechanical efficiency is 0.99 so this is the specific work output produced by the power turbine this will come out to be 277 kilojoule per kg or you can express as kilowatt into second per kg okay. now the compressor delivery temperature is t02 is t01 plus this difference of t02 minus t01 which is 346.3 kelvin so this will be equal to T02 which is 634.3 Kelvin and the combustion temperature raise the amount of the temperature increase in the combustion chamber is uh, maximum cycle temperature minus T02 okay so this will come out to be 715.7 Kelvin so from the given figure which is the 
curve here as shown here so this figure is going to show you the fuel air ratio against the value of the temperature raise in the combustion chamber 5700 is somewhere here and you can find out the value of the fuel air ratio so this will come out to be 0 0.0202 so so from 715 as you can see here 715 will be somewhere here so at this point you can find out the value of the fuel air ratio which comes out to be 0 0.0202 0 2 so this will give you the fuel air ratio of this is the ideal fuel air ratio and in order to find out the actual fuel air ratio this has to be equal to 0 0.202 divided by the combustion efficiency which is 0 0.99 so this will become equal to 0 0.0204 okay now the sfc specific fuel consumption will be equal to the actual fuel air ratio divided by the specific work output produced by the power turbine so this is 3600 times actual fuel air ratio is 0 0.204 and divided by the 278 which is the specific work output produced by the turbine so specific fuel consumption will come out to be 0.265 kilojoule per kilowatt hour so it shows in order to produce the power of one kilowatt hour in order to produce an energy of one kilowatt hour the fuel consumption will be 0.265 kg okay. roughly around one four of kg okay and the thermal efficiency will become equal to 3600 divided by a specific fuel consumption times 43100 so the thermal efficiency will become equal to 31.5 percent the air intake is designed to provide a turbulence-free supply of air to the first stage compressor of the engine, with the minimum energy loss occurring through the inlet. To enable the compressor to operate satisfactorily, the air must reach the compressor at a uniform pressure, which is distributed evenly across the whole face of the first stage. Thus, the design of the intake duct is vital to the performance of the engine, under all air speeds and angles of attack, if compressor stall or surge is to be avoided. The simplest form of intake is a single entrance, circular cross-section, pitot type. The air normally flows directly through the intake when it's fitted to wing-mounted engines. But it can form an S-shaped duct when used on engines which are mounted at the bottom of the aircraft fin, for example like the Boeing 727 or the Lockheed TriStar, which are shown here. Crosswind takeoffs can cause the airflow through this type of intake to become unstable. The pitot type of intake maximizes the use of ram effect on the air due to the aircraft forward speed and suffers only a minimum loss of ram pressure as the aircraft attitude changes. However, the efficiency of the pitot type of engine air intake reduces as the aircraft approaches sonic speed. This is due to the formation of a shock wave at the engine intake lip. The shape of a subsonic intake usually takes the form of a divergent duct. While the aircraft is moving at any appreciable speed, the divergence causes firstly a reduction of the airflow velocity between the lip of the intake and the inlet of the compressor, and secondly an increase of air pressure at the inlet of the compressor. However, while the engine is running on a stationary aircraft, the pressure at the inlet of the compressor is below ambient pressure. This is because the engine compressor is increasing the velocity of the airflow through the intake. As the aircraft begins to move, the pressure within the inlet starts to rise. The ram pressure recovery point is usually reached at between Mach 0.1 to Mach 0.2. As the aircraft's speed increases even further, the ram effect produced by the speed increase, combined with the shape of the inlet, produces more and more ram compression, which causes an increase in the engine compression ratio. This effect generates more thrust without costing any increase in fuel flow. However, as can be seen from this graph, 
At these speeds, the thrust recouped from the effective intake ram pressure does not cause the net thrust level to reach its original zero speed level. Secondary air intake doors, sometimes called auxiliary inlet doors, are required on certain types of aircraft to allow supplementary airflow to reach the compressor face during high power operation when that aircraft is either stationary or at low air speeds. The Harrier is an example of an aircraft which must use high levels of engine power when it has either zero or very low forward airspeed during the vertical takeoff, the hover or landing. During these periods, the demand of the engine compressor for air is extreme. This particular engine air intake is designed for relatively high speed flight and as a consequence is not necessarily capable of allowing in the large mass of air the engine requires when it's running at high power levels at zero forward airspeed. To allow in more air to satisfy the engine demands, up to 16 auxiliary air intake doors have been fitted just behind the lip of the main air intake. At air speeds below which ram pressure recovery can be achieved, the auxiliary air intake doors are held open by the depression in the intake. At higher forward speeds, when the pressure in the intake is greater than ambient, the auxiliary air intake doors are shut by the pressure differential which has been generated. Supersonic aircraft also require a particular type of air intake, which is sometimes called a diffuser, because the engine compressor cannot handle supersonic airflow. Below supersonic speeds, the intake must be able to recover pressure in the same manner as a subsonic intake. But above supersonic speeds, the intake must be capable of reducing the velocity of the airflow below sonic velocity by the formation of shock waves. One important characteristic of a shock wave is that air flowing through it will be slowed. The task of controlling the shock waves that form on or in the air intake which is fundamental if we're to efficiently reduce the velocity of the airflow, is undertaken by a supersonic diffuser. The supersonic diffuser can be quite simple or quite complex, depending on a number of factors, among which is included the supersonic speed range of the aircraft. For instance, many jet fighters are not designed for sustained supersonic flight, and can therefore use quite a simple intake diffuser. Some of the earliest types of supersonic aircraft featured a central shock cone, called an inlet cone, which was used to form the shock wave. This form of shock cone can be seen here on the English Electric Lightning. This diagram shows a simple convergent-divergent diffuser. This design works because of the fact that supersonic flow will slow down as it enters a constricted area. You will note that this is the opposite response to that which happens with subsonic flow. Air flowing at subsonic speeds will accelerate through a constriction. We know from the previous lesson that subsonic airflow through a venturi accelerates towards the throat. At subsonic speeds, the air will maintain a constant density, and as a result, a pressure wave is sent up which causes the air to accelerate through the constriction. However, at supersonic speed, pressure waves cannot move out ahead of the air and cause it to accelerate. Therefore, the air becomes more dense and slows down. This is still all in accordance with Bernoulli's equation, which tells us that if the static pressure increases and the density increases, then the velocity must decrease in order to keep the total energy in the airflow constant. To most people, this tendency of supersonic airflow is more intuitive than what happens in subsonic airflow. The objective of the convergent-divergent diffuser is to slow the airflow to Mach 1 just before the throat of the diffuser. The subsonic flow thus obtained will then slow further as it moves through the divergent section, in fact slowing to well below the speed of sound before it enters the engine. Obviously, the geometry of the diffuser has to be specific to the speed the aircraft is flying. Therefore, if the aircraft is to fly at a range of speeds, some more complex system will be required. Generally, 
The convergent divergent diffuser is only suitable for short bursts of supersonic flight at less than Mark II, such as on the F-15 fighter shown here. For sustained speeds at or above Mark II, the convergent divergent diffuser was modified to use variable ramps to control the airflow into the engine. The angle of the variable throat area intake automatically varies with the aircraft's speed and positions the shockwave to decrease the air velocity at the engine inlet and also maintain maximum pressure recovery within the inlet duct. A more elaborate type of diffuser is the center body design. This design has a sharp center body, sometimes called a spike. The spike strikes the airflow, producing an oblique shockwave. The spike will frequently be designed to produce several weak shockwaves rather than one strong one. The inlet geometry is then such that the air is drawn into the engine inlet at right angles to the shockwave. The resulting flow is subsonic, as happens in the simple convergent-divergent diffuser. It's important that the shockwaves do not enter the inlet, because the high pressure pulses they would create could damage the engine by causing the rotor blades and stator vanes in the compressor to flex. The divergent chamber then slows the airflow further before it reaches the compressor. The position of the spike in relation to its distance ahead of the inlet must vary with the speed of the aircraft. This is accomplished by making the center body position controllable fore and aft in the inlet. It will be extended as the aircraft flies faster and retracted as it slows down. This design is suited to sustained supersonic flight and was used on the SR-71 Blackbird aircraft. 